Good day, Karan. I, I, first of all, let me thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. I've been uh, trying to get you to do this for a number of years. You and I go way back to the early days of the Charlotte chapter of ISPI, the International Society for Performance and Improvement, when you were a student, I believe, at UNCC, University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And I've been, I was very impressed with you way back then. And so I've been very interested to, to catch up with you and do this video. No, Guy, thank you. That is correct. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here finally. It took us maybe three years to arrange this through the pandemic and all. So I appreciate it so much. Well, thank you. And yeah, it has been a while here. So for our audience, I have a, uh, I'm going to introduce you through a series of questions. Mm -hmm. So let's start with, um, give us your, your name and tell us where you grew up. Okay, I'm Kiran Budrani. I am um, currently in Charlotte and I've been here, um, now I'm thinking, eight years since 2014. Initially, I was going to say six, but now it's eight. <laughs> and I moved here um, after like living my whole life in the Philippines. So I was born in Manila and um, that's where I did my schooling and that's where my parents are my my um, siblings are my immediate family are all based currently in the Philippines so tell us uh, where did you go to school and what did you study um, for my bachelor's I did computer science and uh, our computer science in De La Salle University uh, has a major in instructional systems technology it's actually the only school in the Philippines that offers instructional systems technology um, at the bachelor's degree and the only school that offered it at a master's level. And so I was very lucky to get into this program in 2002. And, uh, you know, I felt that instructional systems technology was built for me. And, but I needed to take the computer science route into it. And so um, both of my undergraduate and master's degree um, is from De La Salle University, Manila. And uh, so then what, did you do anything in between getting the master's degree and coming to Charlotte, North Carolina? Um, then I was immediately after I graduated with my bachelor's, my first job was to become a professor immediately in the same program. And that very much was uh, both a blessing and, you know, both a blessing and really sort of destiny for me because my, um, my dream, I think that's the best word to use since I was four was to be a teacher. And I knew it since I was in kindergarten that I was going to be a teacher. And um, before even graduating with my bachelor's, I was offered the job to be a faculty with the department. So that was the information technology department, which hosted the instructional systems technology program. So I was a faculty for eight years. And um, that career progression allowed me to be a consultant too in different capacities um, where I worked with my advisor who was the founder of the program and really the founder of instructional systems technology in the country. So he was like the person to know. His name is Dr. Lloyd Espiritu. And I, I used to say, and I still say, everything I know is from him, you know, as, the, as my first mentor in the field. And so he allowed me to go with him on different experiences through his consulting. And that allowed me to expand my role as a faculty into the, into the, into the world of practice. Excellent. So can you share with us, uh, uh, maybe without naming the names of the companies or naming them, what kind of work did you do as a consultant in, in helping your professor? Yeah, um, we did a lot of things. We did, so we helped the government. Uh, we, I was engaged with the Department of Education and the Commission of Information Communications Technology back then. Um, we helped uh, develop programs for out-of-school youth and out-of-school adults. And these were livelihood programs and we wanted to um, 
impact them through the use of multimedia courseware and e-learning back then. That was like 2006. In the Philippines, there was no e-learning in 2006. Um, and so we were using sort of computer-based instruction back then. And you had we had CD-ROMs and USB drives that we were doing and building flash animation and um, games, you know, for kids. Um, I was also involved with um, uh, like on the corporate side, I got to work with a online advertising company to be a consultant for training, um, training trainers how to build online ads. And that was uh, DoubleClick was their client. And so back in 2005, which was not even like ads were not even prominent yet, we were designing and teaching others how to design online advertisements for um, the outsourcing um, business, which were clients in the United States having to have Filipinos build ads for them. And then I also worked in the call center industry. You know, that was the boom of the business process outsourcing time in the Philippines. And as we know today, a lot of the outsourcing for customer service and uh, call centers is in the Philippines, among others now, India and other places. And so I got involved with a company that was um, selling compliance and security systems and identity secure identity systems and so it was a manufacturing company but they needed customer service and so I was involved in the first like setting up their first e-learning arm for training trainers for uh, training call center agents how to sell how to speak um, what what would be the best way to learn a sales strategy right and convince others to buy into uh, these ideas um, I also worked with um, non like NGOs, non government uh, or nonprofits, where um, we were trying to help farmers build um, training programs to train other farmers to run small businesses, and so. That's a lot. I also worked in the K-12 sector. We, we wrote textbooks for kids on digital lifestyle and digital learning. So a lot of things kind of went all across the board and you go where you're, you're needed, you know. And so that's what that took us, all of us, some with my uh, colleague, Dr. Lloyd Espiritu, some on my own now. Then that was like eight, ten years of work. Excellent. That's uh, quite a bit of experience. And uh so uh, just as an aside here, I, in 1975, I was in the United States Navy and I got a chance to visit Manila and it was a beautiful city. And, uh, but it's a long way from Manila to Charlotte, North Carolina. How, how and why did you come to Charlotte, North Carolina to go to UNCC? It's absolutely long. It's like 35 hours in total. If you're going to take a flight today with three stops, um, well, I came here for different reasons. I didn't, like many foreign students, they would come for schooling. I actually came for different reasons, for more personal reasons. I had some relatives here. Um, I had a personal relationship back then um, in Charlotte. And so that was the reason why um, I actually chose to move here, to kind of settle down and, you know, take the next step in life. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so what brought you into the UNCC program? Well, um, I was interested to look for a job here when I came to Charlotte, and I love teaching. I knew teaching, and I was an assistant professor already, and I thought I could carry that career forward when I first moved here. And so um, I went into UNC Charlotte, which was close to where I live, and I looked for their instructional systems technology program, and I asked, "Can I? is there an opening for a faculty? And I was told that to be a faculty in uh, the department, I had to have a doctorate degree because they were offering a master's in education for uh, instructional systems technology. And now that program is learning design and technology with the evolution of names. And so I said, okay, I need to do a doctorate to get into uh, higher education in general, because it seems to me that that's what the expectation was here. And so then I enrolled in the um, doctorate in educational leadership, and which now has a major in learning design and technology. I see. And so now you are part of the university and you just 
gotten a promotion. But tell us about your jobs there at the university and what you've been doing there. Yes. So first I was a full-time student. In a year or two, I immediately applied for uh, the instructional designer role at the Center for Teaching and Learning. And that shifted my perspective from being a full-time student to a full-time employee. And so then school became secondary because I found my need to help you know, here. And and I knew that there was something I could contribute that was bigger than school. And so um, in my first role as instructional designer, that was about five years. Um, I worked with faculty on online learning course development, quality matters, um, thinking about how to engage in design work for the first time and going beyond workshops where you know what you need to do, but now it's how do you actually do it effectively? And so I was uh, able to work with multiple faculty through faculty development programs, through uh, learning communities, through um, consultations, like a consultation model to really help faculty rethink how is it that they're teaching and how are they achieving their outcomes? Um, In the more recent year, um, I've been engaged with adaptive learning, which is still a form of blended hybrid learning, but we're using more innovative technologies through AI to now support the students better, having more personalized systems that will monitor how they're doing, give them immediate feedback, adapt content and assessments and feedback to to motivate them to do things at home on their own. And so these are more I call them smarter systems um, that we are prototyping now to see if we can scale across the university. And so my role is now the associate director for personalized and adaptive learning. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of that background. My uh, So the, my, the video series here is HPT videos, human performance technology. Of course, it's known by various names and the language keeps changing, as you've already mentioned. But the uh, Can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to evidence-based practices in learning or human performance technology and the learning component of that? Yeah, I guess my first ever exposure was through school. Um, uh, You know, what got me into this? I was in high school and I was um, using these tutorial CD-ROMs every time. And I said, I had this dream of like, I want to build my own CD-ROM that would teach others. And I didn't know what that was. All I knew was there was a thing and and then there was a program that I got into. Um, As I went into the program and I graduated from my undergrad and master's, I was very much exposed to the early work of um, the first ever instructional design book I read was by William Rothwell in 2005. It was called um, uh, Mastering the Instructional Design Process. And it wasn't even like higher education yet. It was, he, his context was workplace learning. And um, I never forgot in, when I read that book that he had the lens of like, everybody has work within a workplace and it, this contributes to the meaning you give to the world. And this framework lived with me. And then um, early works of Mayer through multimedia principles, of course, adult learning principles by... Um, Knowles. Um, I used to be in computer science as a programmer and web developer. So I used to really integrate the components of usability and web design and design in general. I remember I read the book, um, Don't Make Me Think by, um, what's his name? Krog, I think. Um, And it made you think about the user versus, you know, um, and and the audience versus what you were building. Um, my early dissert, uh, not dissertation, but we called it thesis, was on um, helping first-time pregnant mothers learn how to deal with their um, experiences. And so, that, so I was very much in, involved with case-based learning theories back then, which was very much attuned to e-health program development. And so these were some of the early frameworks that... Um, I started with, you know, back in 2006, 2007. Um, Those were my early years, at least, (laughs) in the field. Well, thank you. My next question, which which I'm going to change a little bit, but the question is, who were some of your uh, earliest influences in 
what you do. Now, as a professor, you're dealing with students and their early experiences. So are you sharing with them some of the resources, the people, the books, the articles that were influential to you with them? And, and if so, what are you, what are you pointing them to? Um, you'd be surprised and I was equally surprised when I was going through schooling in my master's and in my undergraduate, we didn't have books. Right? We didn't have access to books that were like prolific and published in the United States that I can see here. Um, what a lot of it was based on the experiences of the instructors we had and the notes that they built during the courses. When I became an instructor, um, I was like, where did we get all this information from? We didn't, I never even read one instructional design book fully until I finished my undergraduate program. And a lot of it was reading online what we could find, but I didn't even have a textbook. Um, and so when I became an instructor, I was like, how do I direct students to something? And so I went back to my colleague who was my advisor and say, where did you learn all this stuff? You know, and then he comes with like two, three books in his hand that he bought when he was in Belgium doing his PhD. And he's like, this is what we, where everything comes from. And I was like, you did not share this before. How did we not know this? And so, you know, our limitation in, in the Philippines is, is really access to materials, especially back then when we didn't have the web with everything today. And so um, from there, I really uh, took it upon to share some of these more, you know, stronger theoretical basis and not just having practice based on experience that you can share, but really solidifying their knowledge bases in theory and um, research that was already in the field that I didn't have enough knowledge on. That was a big learning curve for me when I became an instructor um, back in 2006. Thank you. Let me shift gears a little bit here. This is uh, to help provide an example to others, but the, the topic here is an elevator speech. Mm -hmm. If you were at a neighborhood party and somebody asked you, Karan, what, what do you do? What what would be your elevator speech? What would you tell them? I've said this over and over again. It's hard to explain what instructional designers do. And so I always say, I just help people do their jobs better. Uh, and those people might be in a university. Those people might be students. Those people might be in government. Those people might be kids. It's just helping people do their jobs better and live a more successful life. And so I see that differently when it's corporate, you're helping people have be successful on their job to provide a living for their family and themselves. And then when you're in higher education, you're helping students um, be successful in school so they can find a job to eventually make a living for their family and their life. And so it's the same for me. It's just where you come in into the cycle of somebody's life. Yes. This, this has been a challenge forever. There was a, uh, a, a colleague who's no longer with us uh, at, at NSPI back in the old days before, before NSPI became ISPI, Claude Lineberry. He was a fraternity brother and a business partner with the late Joe Harless. And he, would, he did a couple of uh, sessions at ISPI uh, conferences over the years, and it, it would be a letter from Mama. And he would read this letter from his mama. Of course, it was all fake. But, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that she could not quite understand what he did for a living and was very worried that he was, you know, getting in trouble and had a you know, <laughs> legitimate job or something like that. But, but so we've always made fun of the fact that it's hard to explain to others how in the world you can determine what somebody else's job is that you've never done. And yep. then teach others on how to do a job that you've never done. And it is a challenge. And it's a challenge to explain that. And I've had to do that with relatives too. They could never figure out what it really was that I was doing in my career. My but mom, um, uh, sorry to jump in. Up to today, even though I've been in, in the field as an instructional designer and all kinds of roles as a consultant, my mom and dad and, and my relatives continue to think I'm still a teacher. I'm always a teacher in, in a school. 
because I work in higher education predominantly. So they always think I have always asked me, so what class are you teaching? What students, what are your students doing? I'm always a teacher up to today. It's been like 15 years. <laughs> it, it's it's just easier when you have, you know, they made it easy for you because they've already presumed that you're just a teacher. And so you can live with That's that right. and try to go through the explanation, which is really hard for some to get their minds around, but, but it is what we do. So again, let me shift focus a little bit here. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us anything that you are currently focused on? And are you doing any writing that others could, could read about what your current focus is? Yeah. Um, so I've been in, you know, instructional design for many years. Um, in, in instructional design in higher education bra branches into helping faculty be successful and helping students be successful. And so um, student success is a big thing that, that is a priority for higher education institutions now. My biggest areas this past year is uh, actually from my dissertation work on um, trying to understand what goes on in a non-designer's mind which in this case is a faculty who has no formal training in design as they start designing courses. And so that's my research on design knowledge and practice in among STEM faculty. Um, my dissertation work the last four years was examining what they're thinking and making this visible through visual blueprinting, which are just visual lesson maps where we can now capture uh, what we think they know and actually see what they think they know. And so initially I had this idea of um, teaching in the classroom is very visible. You can see somebody teach and you can see how somebody does it, but mm -hmm. design is not visible. It's something that preempts teaching and it's a back process that is quite hidden. So I wanted to find ways to make the design process and design knowledge more visible and see how we could measure design. Um, consequently, on my job, um, this is not, that's my research interest right now, um, but my job also has expanded my reach towards adaptive learning. So I'm, I'm diving much deeper into uh, looking at analytics and looking at uh, how we can build more personalized uh, experiences and environments for students through systems that exist and envisioning what these systems could look like in the next five, 10 years. It will change really fast. Uh, existing learning management systems will eventually adopt adaptive features. And so I wanna be at the forefront of this. When that happens, we're ready to go, you know, at least for the university uh, and for student success, the area of student success. Are you writing or publishing about uh, any of this? Um, my my publications to date has been focused on uh, faculty development competencies and online teaching. Um, my dissertation would be my next set of um, publications, which is focused on design knowledge and practice. And then I'm currently working on a grant to see if we could engage with adaptive learning in the engineering space. So that might be another avenue for me to um, do a little research and writing on that area. Well, thank you. I look forward to uh, seeing some of that. Uh, my next question is about language, about terminology. Uh, this has been an, an age old issue since I got into the field uh, 40 some years ago, but is there a performance improvement or a learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or it's being misconstrued, but what would you have for us? Well, um, I spent the last five years studying the concept of design. And I myself has evolved, have evolved in this, in my understanding of this word. You know, um, instructional design has the word design in it, right? And we, any new instructor designer first learns design as a process. And it's something you do as part of a bigger process. It, it, it is a process and a very buzzy words nowadays of design thinking um, through the ideal model and all that. It's, it's sort of watering down really what design truly is. And design is something that you really 
um, there's no definition, I think, but it, in my definition, design is not a process that is a linear and fixed way and just a task you do. It is really re-envisioning um, how, how parts work together towards building this future thing that doesn't exist today. That's why we engage in design because there's a problem to solve. And so um, I think that sort of confusing now in the field where it's mixed definitions between learning design, learning experience, design, design in general, design thinking, um, design for design's sake, you know, where you just sort of follow some of these model. Uh, it takes years of experience to be a designer, a true designer of solutions, and it takes patterns of thinking to come up with solutions that might be effective. And this takes years. And so um, I guess that has sort of bothered me a little bit. Um, and there's not enough time to focus on building years of experience for, to be a great designer. You just need to do it to be a great designer. And so um, that's sort of the that's what's bugging me right now in terms of the terminology. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have others too, but that's my like highest. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a there's a probably a long laundry list of terms that uh, could use some additional treatment on. Uh, let me shift gears now to um, again as a way to point our audience to uh, people or books or articles, any kind of resource um, that you think would be helpful, but that have that have come to you more recently that you think people in the performance improvement or in the instructional systems design world should, should think about taking a look at? What, what might you point people to? Yeah, actually, there's a lot. Um, I'm, I've always followed the work of Charles Reigelut. He's a, he's a professor, um, but he's always been uh, prominent to sort of foresee how higher education and school systems might progress. Um, I will always recommend the books, uh, How Learning Works, uh, How People Learn and um, Make It Stick. Make It Stick for me is um, one of the first few books that actually delve into the science of how the brain works and how learning takes place effectively um, within the person and not so much construed with materials and courses. Um, I've recently been very much intrigued with the work of Peter Goodyear from Australia, who um, has proposed that design knowledge is not fixed and can be evolved through the context that you're in. And so that was the premise of the dissertation that I did where the design that you do is highly dependent in the on the context that you're in and context includes everything from the student the instructor the environment um, the institution and you know um, the society that you're in um, I've been kind of engaged recently in how we could make design visible right and so the work of Bucky Dodd from the, Uni the University of Central Oklahoma he has been engaged in developing visualization tools and systems to facilitate these conversations that take place between instructional designers and, and faculty or design teams, thinking about how we can bring stakeholders into the room to have shared visioning. And um, he has these interesting post-it systems that uh, facilitate the shared language of design and uh, course development. Um, I, I, my, I work with Florence Martin, for the last five years, she's her her publication uh, streak is amazing. Everything from engagement to student success. I would always refer anyone to look at her work. Um, and Kurt Bonk, also from Indiana, who um, equally works as a as a faculty, but also is prolific in in you know in our field, especially for higher education. Um, I guess that's all I have in my mind <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good. Those are a lot of pointers. Well, let me uh, wrap up our session here with uh, thanking you for doing this. But my final question to you is, what advice would you give to people new entering the field? What what would be your guidance for them? 
um, one, uh, have a strong instructional design theory base that always some, is something you can transfer as you go to different jobs. Uh, I've always benefited from a mentor or two or three now. Um, find somebody you can learn from and, and imagine yourself being. Um, and always share back to the world what you know and keep teaching others how to make this job successful because um, who knows what you can pick up from it, from somebody's experience on how they solve problems. So maybe those are my top three at the moment. Karan, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with me today and uh, sharing your insights. Uh, I, I wish you well, and I'm looking forward to uh, watching your career progress uh, further and further. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Guy. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate the time. I think we had such a great um, conversation today. Um, you too, you know, take care of yourself and, you know, I'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.